John, are you out there? Yeah, I'm here, George. Oh, good. Good to talk to you again. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, um, since uh, since Tucson a few weeks ago, and um, that's right. I, I saw you in Tucson at the Consciousness Conference. Right. Yeah. And so I, I definitely want to talk about that. But uh, before that, I, I have to tell you about this crazy thing that's happening uh, to me. That yeah. Uh, since then. So, um, I, uh, you know, I, I spent all this time writing up, uh, Tucson and then, uh, I kind of remembered at the last minute that, um, I'd been invited to give a talk at a, a major skeptic conference. It's the mm -hmm. Northeast conference on science and skepticism held in New York city. Okay. And, uh, it turned out, so I was giving the last talk at the conference, not because I'm an important person, but because that was the last slot they had available. I'm pretty sure that. <laughs> you, you, you were a last minute addition to the agenda. Yes. Okay. And I, th I thought it would be fun to uh, give the skeptics a taste of their own medicine, you know, because I, I was pretty sure that they could uh, take it. So I thought okay. um, I'd talk about some things about skepticism and about science in general that have bothered me lately. It's the kind of celebration of science, cheerleading for science, and using science as a cudgel to bash people over the head who have uh, unscientific beliefs like uh, belief in, in religion and homeopathy and uh, uh, ESP and, and things like that. <laughs> so yeah. the, the title of my talk was um, Soft Targets versus Hard Targets. Mm -hmm. And uh, so by soft targets, I meant um, uh, beliefs that the skeptics can attack without much fear of retaliation, and uh, well, except from the homeopaths and yeah, and the, and the psychic surgeons and right, except except that uh, and Deepak Chopra. And, except I don't think those people really give a damn about what the skeptics say. That my attitude uh, was that the a lot of the writing of skeptics, and this is a gross generalization. Yeah, uh, I'll just admit that right now. Uh, my talk was very <laughs> Get that blunt. out of the way. Yeah, <laughs> right. okay. Uh, but uh, I feel as though a lot of the skeptics and the sort of science celebrators write for each other, for people within their tribe, and I actually use that term, tribe. Yeah. And I, so and I, yeah, yeah. I, I said that I thought that the tribalism within the skeptic, the scientific skeptic community, was a bad thing, and mm. uh, so I, I tried to call them out on that. And I, I pointed out what I thought were more worthy hard targets, which are uh, beliefs propagated from uh, within the scientific community and in some cases by really major figures within science mm -hmm. and were also celebrated by skeptics, people like Richard Dawkins and, and uh, Lawrence Krauss and Steve Pinker and others. And, yeah. and then I basically rattled off all the things that I really care about. And I, I admitted later that a title of my talk could have been uh, stop, stop spending so much time on the things you care about and spend more time on the things that I care about, <laughs> and, uh, especially warfare. Uh -oh. So the, the end of my talk devolved into a, a rant with which you're very familiar against American militarism and, and war yeah. and uh, in general and theories that I think theories about the origins of war that I think are wrongheaded. And, um, and what, what was really weird was that, you know, so I gave my talk and meanwhile, there's this MC who I, I'd never heard of before. His name is Jamie Swiss. He's, I think an old skeptical magician in the, in, in the same vein as, uh, as Randy. Oh, uh -huh. um, and he, uh, was really pissed off at me. And um, I had deliberately kept my talk short so I could have time for questions. And, and yeah. uh, this guy, Jamie, wouldn't let me take questions, even though I had oh. time left in my yeah. slot, hmm. and uh, proceeded to uh, denounce me to the crowd yeah. in really strenuous terms. And so I kind of slunk out of the auditorium thinking, okay, so, you know, this was a failed experiment. But then, even before I got out of the auditorium, people started coming up to me and saying, hey, man, I thought that was a great talk, and uh, that wasn't cool mm. how, Rand, how uh, Jamie handled you, and, uh, you know, I didn't agree. Virtually every person said, I didn't agree with everything you said, but, uh, yeah. but you know, I thought, 
the movement could use some shaking up. And then I, you know, I went into the lobby afterwards and there were a whole bunch of people there who were eager to talk to me. And we had this great conversation about the pros and cons of uh, American medicine and uh, uh, theoretical physics. The yeah, the, the, these were some of your, your hard targets. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, like medical testing and the right. efficacy of mammograms and yes, exactly. PSA tests and, and then the... Um, uh, whether war is uh, uh, endemic in the in the species and yes, in the things that yeah, your yeah, some of your some some, ma some of your major themes. Right, right. <laughs> and so we had okay, and 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 these were really these were people who were you know they're giving me strong pushback, uh, but we had a great a great conversation. Um, yeah, for about yeah. I don't know forty five minutes or an hour. Yeah. And, uh, and then I left thinking a, a frank a frank exchange of ideas yeah, which is exactly, in diplomatic circles. Right. Which is exactly what I'd hoped for. Mm. And then I thought, OK, I'm going to, you know, make the most of this. I'm going to post it online. So I posted yeah. the, the transcript of my talk pretty much verbatim mm -hmm. on um, on my blog. There's no video, though, is there? Uh, no, but there is a picture of me wearing and I'm actually wearing it now. I'll, I'll show it to the uh, blogging as audience. I, when I gave the talk, I was wearing a T-shirt uh, that Valerie, my girlfriend, gave me called Stop Wars in the Typography of Star Wars. Oh. So people kind of <laughs> double take when they see it. Okay. So yeah. I actually wore uh -huh. this at the Tucson conference also. Oh. Um, and, uh, and since then, since it was posted on my blog, I've gotten, I think it's fair to say, maybe the most intense reaction to anything I've written wow. on my blog. Um, mm -hmm. both pro and con. Um, yeah. Some of the really major, some of the, the major skeptics, people who had organized this conference I spoke at, uh, especially a couple of medical skeptics named uh, David Gorski and Steve Novella. Oh, yeah, right. They really came at Evidence-based me medicine. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, they were very critical, and a bunch of other people were too. Mike Shermer took shots at me, and yeah. Lawrence Krauss. Jerry yeah, were they, were they at the conference or no? They weren't at the conference, but I had, uh, you know, I'd taken shots at them in my piece. Oh um, yeah, right. The cross, the, your cross's argument that uh, that he can explain how uh, something and in fact everything comes from nothing. Right. Yeah. And right. I and I pointed out that Richard Dawkins, in an afterward for Krauss's book, had mm -hmm. compared. Uh, Krauss's book to On the Origin of Species. Oh, yeah, right. Which I remember I that. Which I thought indicated how uh, Dawkins's antipathy toward religion severely impaired his scientific judgment. Yeah. And, and this, the th these were all things you said in your talk. Yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, 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 the differences that you have with Steven Pinker on uh, Origins of War. I mentioned. I, him as a propagator of what I call the deep roots theory of war, which I think is very poorly supported hmm. by the evidence. And yeah. uh, this and book so, is really seems seems kind of the opposite, doesn't it? It's um, this very optimistic. It's a little complicated. It's he he supports the idea that humans before civilization were extremely violent, very mm -hmm. warlike, uh, with yeah. higher rates of. Uh, of mortality from violence than at any time since then. And that, mm -hmm. I think, is a false claim. Hmm. And he also um, downplays the violence of modern nation states and especially the United States, which I think is yeah. a problem when you're trying to understand why war happens. But, but he still world. remains optimistic. He is. You know, like, like with the, the, the title of the Angels book, uh, What is the Better Angels of Our Nature, just yes. assuming that even if it is endemic, that doesn't mean that we can't overcome it. And That's right. Just, and yeah, I, okay. I wrote a really positive review of that book. I've got a little update. I've got a little response to Pinker that I just uh, posted this morning. In oh, my okay. First, I, I posted three different pieces on this whole controversy. Uh, you know, the first, the initial transcript of my talk mm -hmm. plus two follow ups, and I just posted a response to Pinker on um, on my first. Uh, along with that first uh, posting, that first Oh, okay. So essay. we can link to link So, to I, you know, I, I, it's, I, I understand why some of these people are irritated because I... Oh, well, I, yeah. <laughs> because 
my piece was kind of I was deliberately trying to provoke a reaction. Yeah. And right. I did. And so I, you know, my piece was not nuanced. It was pretty blunt. Yeah. Um, but I thought I you know, I don't regret any of the things I said. I think my main points were were uh still valid. Um, yeah. And uh and I you know, I have still gotten I've gotten a lot of emails. I even got a phone call from people who were who were associated with the uh the skeptic conference I spoke at mm -hmm. who said that um you know they think it's healthy for skepticism mm -hmm. to con confront these issues. They, yeah. they all made the point that that these issues have been de debated in the past. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, I can think of, you know, two different lines of objections um to your talk, you know, what one being that, you know, I mean, who says that, you know, skeptics have not been uh, skeptical of theories of origins of war or skeptical of the value of medical testing and this is this is something they've done all along and also um I mean, every every group you know, has a different different niche and it's not doesn't necessarily seem to follow that their niche would have to embrace all of that in addition to um um, debunking the pseudoscience, which, you know, even though it's a soft target, I think it's a pretty dangerous, dangerous current in society. And it's appalling how, you know, this long discredited knowledge is just recycled year after year with no, you know, reality testing doesn't seem to diminish it in the least. And I totally so, get that. And, and, yeah. a, and a couple of the, the organizers, the people I mentioned just now, Gorski and Novella, have actually written a lot about problems in medicine. I just well, yeah, I, I went to that website a lot when I was uh, writing the Cancer Chronicles and a lot of my cancer columns, especially when I was looking into this, you know, like like places like MD Anderson Cancer Research Center have these, you know, these new agey kind of, you know, meditation, wisdom of the yeast kind of programs. And, <laughs> and you know, the, the defense of those is that, you know, this is just, you know, ways to help people you know, deal with the stress while they're getting, you know, real um, so-called allopathic cancer treatments, the stuff that work, you know, as well as anything works better, obviously, than than the uh, than pseudoscience and the, you know, the fringy folk beliefs, but yes. it, that it's a way to get people into the door. And maybe if they come to a, a workshop on meditation, you know, you know, either because they're suffering from the stresses of chemotherapy or, because maybe they falsely think this has, you know, something to do with their cancer, their stress. Well, again, that's too simple because stress does seem to raise the... But anyway, I'm kind of rambling well, on I, here because I, 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 I followed their stuff and, you know, it yeah. seems seems really good. Well, here's here's what I just said about them this morning. I thought, you know, okay. they, they definitely have written a lot about some of the, the limitations of tests for cancer, mammograms, PSA tests yeah. for prostate cancer. That's what I and, thought. Uh, and, and so forth. And Gorski himself is a breast cancer surgeon, so you know, right. he really cares about this stuff. And here's what I just argued in a little addendum to my initial post this morning. I, you know, by far the majority of the, the things that they post on are on alter alternative medicine, homeopathy, yeah. uh, naturopathy yeah. or something. I, right, I, naturopathy. Yeah. yeah, this is dangerous stuff. You know, it's keeping people from getting getting real and effective treatments. I, and here's, here's the problem I have. When they address the problems of mainstream medicine, I feel as though they are not, they're, they're protective. They are yeah. not applying the same critical standards that they apply when they go yeah. after alternative medicine. So mm. Gorski and his writings on mammograms, I feel as though, and people can go and judge for themselves, that he's tying himself in knots, trying to come out uh, to a conclusion where mammograms are salvaged somehow. Yeah. He has never said women should not get uh, mammograms when I think that's actually where the data are pointing. Yeah, I, well, it's I, it's somewhat more nuanced than that, isn't it? I mean, it depends on that, you know, the age cutoffs and uh, you know the risk factors. Well, here's the genetic thing: genetic risk I, factors, environmental risk factors. I just told people genetic. to look at. I think it's really hard to get. You know, the, the tribalism of people within mainstream medicine is understandable. All right, but I think it's really valuable when you find physicians who are looking at uh, medical practices 
and are absolutely unbiased and uh, willing to go where the evidence leads. And one of the rare places that does that is the Cochrane Collaboration. Or have you heard of them? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah I yeah, mean, I, again, I referred to many of their reports when I was writing my cancer book. They're fantastic, and so I yeah. think that in contrast to some of the medical skeptics like Gorski and Novella, the Cochrane Group really is brutal yeah. in its assessment of yeah. medical treatments and tests and. Uh, and so forth. And well, I on the other hand, it's not Cochrane's um, purview to write about homeopathy and naturopathy and no. And you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just you know playing devil's advocate here and saying you know, there's you know people people specialize and have their different niches and things that they that's true that they that they feel feel motivated in their heart to go after. That's true. I I but I think it hurts the credibility. Of, see the the alternative medicine people accuse Gorski and Novella and the other uh, medical skeptics of basically just defending conventional um, medicine because uh, you know that's that's where their income comes from. They you know they accuse them of really base motives. I don't believe yeah. that. No. But no. I think that that when when the medical skeptics apply a double standard and I think they do, mm -hmm. uh, then it it lends some credence it undermines their their credibility when yeah. they um when they attack uh the alternative medicine or when they write about any of these issues <laughs> and so i just wanted to point out that there is a source of medical information the cochrane collaboration that um that has very little vanishing little bias that i can detect and that is is uh presenting some conclusions about medical tests um, and also about psychiatric drugs, which is another thing that I talked about in my post, that are really mm. disturbing. And so I'm just encouraging people to go and check out those yeah. alternatives. Yeah, okay. So, so, so you're saying that, that on evidence-based medicine, it's not that they don't address those issues, but you feel that they do it in a way that's very defensive to the, to um, kind of the common practice of, yes. of medicine. Okay. I, 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 I've, I've all I've read on their side is their like their debunkings of um, so-called integrated therapies and you know all of the stuff that brings the new age into into um, major cancer centers and that that seemed pretty effective to me. And I agree, I agree. It when they write about those things, I think they're yeah. devastating. And um, yeah, and um, I you know they I agree that. Those are things that should be uh, criticized. Yeah. I'm just but, much but you more... think it would be stronger if they if they had this wider purview and or if they were just no because they're looking at some of the other well, yeah, problems right. in mainstream medicine. Yeah. I just don't think that they are equally uh, critical, and I think those yeah. targets are more important financially and in terms of the health of of uh, your average Americans and yeah. uh, and so yeah. Forth. I don't know. I mean, I hear so much from the, you know, every time, like when I wrote a column last year about uh, electrosensitivity in cell phones, or you write about cell phones and brain tumors, and, <laughs> right. and you know, you, you, you show people what the evidence or lack of evidence of harm really is, and you get overwhelming amounts of, um, you know, blowback from people. And a lot of these are not 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 stupid people. Yeah. And and then they're armed with you know I, I wrote another column about that where I referred to their own personal science. You know they've come up with their own um, cut through through the science and the studies that you know support their position. And then it's gone to another level of sophistication where uh, you start pointing out to them how they're cherry picking the evidence, and then they point out to you how they see that you're cherry picking the evidence, and right. and then before you know it, you've gone down the postmodern rabbit hole where everything <laughs> is relative and it depends on power structures and who has the power defines the reality, and <laughs> yeah, and you know I, I think this stuff is is dang very dangerous, and and then again I'm not sure it's possible to debunk it because these people are armored to the, to the teeth. Yeah. I, and I, I, I appreciate your position living in Santa Fe, which is like, a hot... oh, well, Santa Fe kind of gets a bad rap for that. Because, oh, you think so? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, you, you'll have just as much of this new agey stuff in New York city or anywhere. I mean, Santa Fe, you know, we also have the Santa Fe Institute. We have the 
Los Alamos National Laboratory, which despite most people's assumption, does a hell of a lot more than study how to make uh, nuclear bombs. You know, right. they have this huge immunological, uh, um, a theoretical immunology program uh-huh. and, and cosmology program. Mm-hmm. They have world-class physicists like Wojtek Zurich there. And, and these people all come in and out of Santa Fe. They give talks. You see them at see them at gatherings and we have these you know this great science lecture series sponsored by well one by the santa fe institute one by los alamos and one by the school of advanced research which Mm -hmm. is more now social science it used to be anthropology so anyway i had to inject this this defense this is (laughs) not this is is not sedona this is not sedona but i apologize (laughs) for my vicious slur against santa fe <laughs> and 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 actually, You've been here. you are correct yeah. that right out out here in New York, some of the people who are nearest and dearest to me believe in all kinds of wacky shit. So, yeah, yeah, like homeopathy, right? That's right, homeopathy. Yeah, astrology. Oh man, I got you, you know. I I wrote a column about the Tucson Consciousness Conference. Yeah, listen, since we're talking about yeah. now, we're talking I, I, about. Yeah, yeah, are you? I mean, uh, I. I you know, we can just, uh, spend more time on this if you want, but I figure people can go and, you know, and find yeah, yeah. No, on the web because you've also um, put all the links to the to the um, to the blowback you've received. But, yeah, I just want to ask you one more thing. Uh, oh, OK, sure. Did you I mean, what were you thinking when you <laughs> when I mean, OK, let me back up and ask a pre question. Sure. Why did they invite you in the first place? And okay. two, what were you thinking when you gave this? This talk and and in the part three, um, did you think it was going to result in in this much uh, turmoil? Well, okay. First question: um, There's a philosopher, Massimo Pigliucci. I hope I mm-hmm. pronounced his name correctly. I met him at Stevens. Uh, let's see. I guess it was um, uh, sometime within the last uh, few months, and uh, I I really hit it off with him. And he mentioned that he's part of this skeptic community uh, okay. has been hanging out with some of these people. And I said, I'd like to go to one of those conferences and give a talk. And he said, ah. he said, uh, Hey, well, maybe I'll get you an invitation. And so, oh, did. okay. I see. And, uh, and then, and then, as I said, I thought, I thought, I'm not going to preach to the converted because I don't like to do that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to try to stir the pot a little bit and, and see what happens. And, um, in terms of the reaction, uh, I, you know, I'd say, um, yeah, it's stronger than I expected, but overall, and I'm a little distressed at how, you know, there are people, I've been compared to uh, uh, a beauty pageant winner, to a pedophilic wrestling coach. I mean, people, the invective. Really? Is, yeah. The invective has been really over the top. Hmm. You know, people, oh, I, you know, people have asked me if I actually am a member of Scientology. Um, you know, huh. all this kind of, so you're being attacked personally. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I, but you know, it's so I'm actually a little disappointed at the childishness of some of the, uh, reactions, but I've also gotten a lot of great feedback and people are, yeah. um, I think, um, having, uh, engaging with me in a constructive way and I'm trying to be constructive in my responses. So, um, and I've heard from some high-ranking skeptics that they think it's a good thing, as I said before. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah. I mean, a lot of this also, in addition, seems to have reignited these kind of long simmering disagreements or even feuds. Yeah, I, you know, like with you, you, you and Kraus, and and uh, right. Well, and and I what I didn't realize. I mean, I'm not. There is a incredibly tangled internal politics of the skeptics movement, which is which overlaps quite a bit with the atheist movement. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, I've picked up a little bit on that. Sometimes just from like these Twitter wars and yeah, and I, and, and, I, and also getting into issues of uh, of uh, sexual harassment. And, yes. Yeah, and I don't know the details, but I, I had the feeling that it's, there's a lot of it's a very complex complex little system yeah and and part of me you know i that one of the reasons i don't want to be part of these groups is because of all that bickering 
uh, that internal uh, bickering. And I, you know, I've, I've gotten a taste of that now, but I, I still think that there's been some pretty high level uh, discussion too. But so who knows how yeah. it'll resolve yeah. itself, but I have no regrets. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and, uh, as you but, can see, I'm, 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 you know, very carefully determined to stay out of this. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame you, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, 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 I think you, there's a sense in which you kind of thrive on being embroiled and in this sort of thing that I, I really don't. I, I like arguing. I, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I. I like arguing when I think it actually might get somewhere. I changed my mind now and then. You listen. You were one of the people who helped change my mind on nuclear power. Oh, and, and I I'm think that started sure with believe. me ranting about the evils of nuclear power. And, yeah, that's and true. Said, that's true. Hey, man, you're saying hey. some wrong shit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I changed I, my mind as a result of that. I think my problem is I'm really an agnostic on almost everything. So I, I you know, I was thinking about this before <laughs> I talked to you. I think because I'm not sure if, what my position is. I go back and forth. Well, I, I. I think I'm more skeptical than a lot of the skeptics. I don't think there are many people who are more skeptical than I am, but you yeah, are. you're skeptical of everything. But you are. No, you're more skeptical oh. than I am. Oh. Yeah. But in, in a lower key way? No. Well, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, yeah, stylistically, maybe uh, you're not yeah. as confrontational, but but yeah, you're okay. you know you're more skeptical. You're you're more skeptical of fundamental scientific claims uh, than I am. Um, well, yeah, I mean, like fire in the mind was kind of a, yeah. I mean, it is an ex exploration of, but but from the point of view of, you know, how do we know what we know and, uh, you know, the difference between inventing and discovering knowledge. But I think I come out as, you know, basically, you know, pr pretty agnostic and just exploring these, what to me is a deep mystery. Yeah, I, well, I, I've said that compared to you, I am a naive realist. And yeah. Uh, um, and so, oh yeah, yeah. I'm not a knight. Yeah, you're not. Well, that a knight. actually, that, that's actually a nice segue also into consciousness. Yeah, so, let's talk about it, consciousness. Yeah, now, you know, there was that interesting, interesting piece by uh, Galen Strawson, the philosopher. Yeah, uh, in, in the uh, New York Times op-ed in that in that really uh, great series they run called The Stone, mm -hmm. and this was the whole thing about the. Um, you know, the mind-body problem and the hard problem of consciousness, which, you know, was, I guess that was indeed coined by David Chalmers, right? At the I first saw the talk. Tucson conference. You saw that. And I that saw the when, talk where he introduced it. Yeah. Okay. And then Chalmers, just to give some, some background, is, um, well, now he's at NYU, right? Mm -hmm. Very high-powered philosophy department. And, and at the time that he... Um, Gave the talk, the famous talk in Tucson in what, 94? 94, yeah. Yeah, he had like uh, like hair down to his shoulder or was it his waist? I think it was almost and, down to his waist. It was yeah, really and he looks totally different now yeah. because, you know, people who want to, you know, read my column can click on a link and see him in a rock video about rationalism versus <laughs> empiricism, but, <laughs> um, he, it, which is which is brilliant by... Um, but yeah, so this thing by about by Strassen was basically arguing that you know the hard problem is saying that it's it's explaining how something like the mind can arise from matter from the matter of the brain something as seemingly ethereal as consciousness can arise from you know biological reactions and in neurons are and and the the only answer has been kind of this hand wavy you know it, it emerges from you know when you get a certain degree of complexity you know it's stuff we've talked about yeah a lot on on uh, on this uh whatever this is this video <laughs> thing <laughs> but 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 then strassen was making the point that you know the real deep mystery is what matter is and it's not so much that uh it's mysterious that consciousness arises from matter, but what the hell is matter? And and that's you know, and I guess to a naive realist that would seem you know obvious, you know, that matter is you know the solid stuff of which we and everything is made. But but you know that really struck me as a, a really interesting interesting perspective because when you really start looking at the physics of matter and, and find that it you know reduces down to um, you know quantum field theory and all of these abstractions and and somehow there's a sense in which there are these things that we treat as abstractions out of which matter arises. And so why is it so mysterious then? You know, I mean, it's no 
more mysterious, perhaps, that consciousness arises from matter than that matter somehow arises from physical laws. From I right? agree. I, I like that piece, even though I thought it's basically just a, a, a subtle reframing of the same old problem. But I mm. like it because it sort of deepens the mystery. I What I love about the mind-body problem, which I've been thinking about even more obsessively lately than, than I have in, in the mm. past, is that the more you think about it, I think if, th if you think about, about it correctly, which is maybe an arrogant way to put it, but um, everything becomes mysterious. You start, well, yeah. you start yeah. with, yeah, mind is mysterious, <laughs> but yeah, matter is really fucking mysterious yeah. too yeah. when you think about yeah. it. Yeah. You know, uh, Noam Chomsky actually talked about the mind-body problem in this way. He said hmm. that he thought that, you know, you go back to Newton's formulation of gravity, which is action across a distance, it makes yeah. no sense. Yeah. Action across a vacuum. How could that possibly be? That's yeah. bizarre. Yeah. Uh, and yet, you know, we've just kind of accepted it. That's the way things are. And, yeah, and well, so, now it's explained in, you know, with field theories. Well, it depends what you, what you mean by explained. And that's, yeah. that's well, Chomsky's yeah, point. Well, yeah, that I know. These, that, yeah. You know, some of the... Physical reality is weird, too, that there's matter which has these extraordinary properties like gravity mm -hmm. and that mind is just sort of in that category of yeah. really weird properties of yeah. matter. Uh, yeah. That's the way he framed it, um, you know, decades ago. Yeah, and, which is kind of what Nagel says, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So Thomas Nagel, the philosopher, also at NYU, there with Chalmers now. And the, the weirdest position of all, I, I still think, comes from, among others, a very smart philosopher, Daniel Dennett, who has tried to say, if you think about the mind-body problem in the right way, then it's really not that big a deal. It's not, mind isn't that mysterious. Yeah, And right. I think that, to me, is the most, I mean, Dennett's brilliant, but that, that point of view of his has always struck me as, as bizarre. And well, yeah, his book, um, yeah, well, yeah, I, you know, when he, when he came out with that, with his book, uh, Consciousness Explained, right? you know, I mean, talk about a wonderfully arrogant, you know, lay down the gauntlet, throw down the gauntlet kind of title. And I, I reviewed that for the, for the New York Times book review, and I, I thought it was wonderful. It, it, uh, and, and there were like moments when, when I was completely convinced that I finally got what consciousness was and didn't need to worry about it anymore, but it didn't, you know, it didn't last too long. And then uh, it was funny. I had De Dennett uh, a few years ago. Was, uh, he was up at the Santa Fe Institute. This program they call the Miller Scholars, and uh, had him over over to the house for dinner. And uh, I still have the review, of, <clears throat> excuse me, framed on the wall because it was. Uh, was the first time I wrote a review for the New York Times book review that made the cover. Mm -hmm. So, so that was nice. And um, you know, it turns out he really appreciated the review, <laughs> well, <was laughs> even it? though it was somewhat skeptical. Uh -huh. But uh, I guess uh, more <clears throat> more awestruck than skeptical, maybe. But you know, I don't know. And then I, I got some reactions like that to my column I wrote about the consciousness conference that. Uh, you know, well, consciousness is really just a category error in the way we think. Right. And, well, yeah, but, you know, what's this thinking that's causing this category error and and, and this um, drive that makes us sit here wondering about whether consciousness is real or an illusion? I mean, does it does the category error explain that? I mean, it well, just I, seems like an, an endless regress and... Getting to my suspicion that it's an unanswerable question. Let me let me just back up a second and tell yeah, people yeah. what this crazy conference is. Oh yeah, right. So that's, this that's is a good idea. So it, it's now it's called the science of consciousness. The first one uh, was held it, uh, in Tucson, Arizona, in 1994. Back then, it was called Toward a Science of Consciousness, and it's uh, over. So almost a week, it's, it, it's, you know, there are workshops, there are big plenary lectures by famous people, then there are poster sessions and concurrent sessions. It's this big, sprawling, chaotic conference 
with the most mainstream possible people and then just flat out loons and yeah, cranks. Yeah. And with every possible approach to consciousness represented from very hardcore neuroscientific attempts to find what are called the neural correlates of consciousness to uh, talks about extrasensory perception and uh, really esoteric uh, quantum theories of consciousness. Uh, it's been yeah. happening every two years, ever since 94. And I went to that first conference and loved it. I wrote a big article about it for Scientific American. Oh, we should link to that. And I thought it would be fun to go back this year. And, uh, and you and I overlapped one day and yeah about a day and a half i think yeah and you heard some stuff that i really wish <laughs> i had heard uh so maybe because yeah. one, one of the big additions to the conference recently is that uh deepak chopra mm. um who's the i guess alternative i'm not sure how to describe him, alternative medicine i i I, I settled for a new age huckster in my column <laughs> okay <laughs> that, that seemed to I, I was really you know I, originally I had a couple of paragraphs you know and I uh, I, uh, I, I I quoted uh, you know just some people describing his you know his position as uh, like self-serving psychobabble or something like this but then in the end I decided just to cut it down to that one adjective which to me kind of says it all without belaboring. The point. I mean, I guess to me, he's a pretty soft target, and yet, you know, here he was giving, you know, plenary talk at this this conference. That really bothered me. So it's one thing I got into in my column, but you know, fairly deep down, you know, as deep as you can go in a thousand word column. But um, my take was just, or my approach in this one column was to emphasize the weird juxtaposition of very serious scientists and philosophers and uh, you know people like david chalmers is there or stan dehane and and um and um uh, alison gopnik alison gopnik you know just like this real stellar stellar cast of of people and then at the same time you have a um you know a session well let me find the exact name of it it was oh it was i called. love this i know what you're gonna say <laughs> yeah Okay, well, actually, yeah, okay. Vibrations? Was it Vibration scale and topology. So as soon as I saw that on the schedule, I thought, well, you know, I, I had to choose between that and another, you know, well, my, my, the other choices were, I, I put this in my column, uh, neural correlates of consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, the extended mind, and then your eye kind of lights, or agency and mental causation. Okay. And I decided to go to vibration scale and topology, where a musician from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who called himself Timberwolf, was strumming a guitar and singing the Bing song. <laughs> and the Bing song, you know, Bing is this word that Stuart Hammer Hammeroff, who started these conferences, um, uses to describe the moment when the spark of consciousness lights up the brain. And it's a very catchy, catchy little tune. And and so I kind of, you know, I, I I wanted to use that stuff, but then couch it in a way to make clear that there was a lot of serious discussion going on, on but that maybe this was a symptom of how impossible this whole area is, that you get the real serious stuff that hasn't really gotten us, I don't think, anywhere um, juxtaposed with this really crazy stuff, and then kind of bringing it around to what seemed to me like, you know, just, uh, I, I just can't understand why they would... Uh, give someone like Deepak Chopra a plenary session, but of course his Chopra Foundation is one of the big funders, but that just makes it look even worse. And what bothered me particularly, you know, like all the, you know, he'd be on the stage with these other, you know, very serious scientists and, you know, no one was like condemning him or, or, or during the question and answer sessions, you weren't hearing people, you know, really, you know, questioning his presence there and the fact that he's not, you know, he's just doing this, you know this very this new age stuff for profit. He was there hawking his latest uh, self help books and some kind of little machine you could use to tune into the into the cosmos. And <laughs> well, I, I just I, I just I mean th that makes me think that you know that we need to, you know the skeptic should be coming down on this guy. And, and yeah, Jerry Coyne has had written some very scathing things about Chopra. Okay, here two two responses to that. Yeah. Um, one, Stuart Hammeroff, 
the organizer of this conference. Yeah, the quantum right? consciousness guy. Who is yeah. still a huge presence. You know, he, he gave a plenary talk himself. Yeah. There were a lot of people who were basically uh, talking about versions of his quantum Oh, yeah, I was amazed. I, I didn't realize that, that it had spawned a whole little, um, you know, sub subfield. Oh, cottage industry. And, cottage uh, industry. And, and here's the thing. Stuart Hameroff uh, suggests that his theory can explain paranormal phenomena. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, you know, if you're talking about, it's, it's pretty hard. So you can't exactly say that Deepak Chopra represents sort of mm. a new low when, you know, the woo has been there for a oh, long uh, time. And it's, yeah, part, and it's sort yeah. of built into the infrastructure of the conference. Another point I'd like to make is that David Chalmers... And Christoph Koch, who was not there but, uh, this year, but has mm. been there a lot in the past, was yeah. there in 1994. He advocates a theory called um, integrated information theory, which I think you and I have talked about. Yeah, we talked about that. You, you did some columns on it. Yeah. And, and, well, and, and more generally, panpsychism. Yeah, so it implies panpsychism. Which but, but panpsychism, to me, I mean, it's, it's becoming a respectable idea, whether it's right or wrong. I think the fact that it's becoming respectable is in the same general ballpark. This is going to be really unfair, but I'll just finish it as as Timberwolf. I think it's another. No. I think it's another indication <laughs> that the field that the field is just desperate. It's grasping at straws. When the, well, when yeah. This, I mean, that was kind of the subtle theme of my my, my column that, that that this is such a difficult, possibly unsolvable problem that it just brings out, you know, people from, from, you know, every approach imaginable, most of them, you know, sincerely wanting to get to the bottom of this, but sometimes, you know, through some very, very uh, questionable ways. But to me, I'm actually going to do my next column about panpsychism, I think, because Ooh. to me, it's really interesting that this has become an idea that's being entertained and not just being you know, dismissed like, uh, we'll say, ESP and homeopathy, for example. You know, here I actually, I gave what was weird about this year's conference is that I gave a talk. I kind of twisted Stuart. All oh, right, talk. yeah, and that was after I had to leave, so. He, he, I, I basically forced Stuart, I, I, you know, I screamed and yelled until he said, okay, I'll let you give a concurrent session talk. <laughs> and I had 25 minutes, and uh, it was at the end of a long day. Everybody was really tired and i basically said my question was has has the field of science of the science of consciousness actually gone backwards since i was first here yeah. in 1994 and um i used the popularity of panpsychism um as a as a sign that it has gone backwards that that major people are now taking this idea seriously which goes back to you know plato and buddha and and, and uh, people like that. One mm. of the points that I tried to make, and see if you, you agree with this, is that it's, you know, the, the great question, if you're looking at consciousness or life, um, is where, how, where is it latent in the, in the laws of physics? You know, mm. as far as we know, the universe started as a strictly physical phenomenon, and then, you yeah. know, we happened. So how well, yeah. is that? This is this is what Tom yeah. Nagel's book Mind and Cosmos was about. Right. And right. I what I said at the in my talk was that panpsychism it says that consciousness was just there in matter from the very beginning and that's cheating. I think. Well, is it I, I mean I, I I don't know and this is the kind of thing I'm I'm mulling over while I think about about um, this column I'm you know starting to work on because I mean, there, there are times in science where, where we've been backed. We, I mean, scientists have been backed into this cul-de-sac, and the only way out is to invent something new and very basic. Yeah. And an example is dark matter. An example is dark energy. And I think you could argue that the cul-de-sac was very specifically defined and constrained, so that these, um, these two inventions were, were. Uh, equally constrained in, in a way that, you know, with, you know, that, that they've opened themselves to some testing, although there's a certain circularity with the testing 
like with dark matter, where you posit the existence of dark matter, and then it, uh, and then you see these phenomena like a star that's here when it should be slightly over there if there weren't dark matter, and this is taken as proof of dark matter when it could be, you know, just a, another indication that we're missing something, and it's not necessarily dark matter, but we need to adjust the. Uh, you know, got gravitational constant or make it variable or something like this. But, um, but I mean, so how is panpsychism different from that? I mean, it's hard to see how it's testable. So that yeah, is one difference. Well, that's, that's, that's one. I, I, I think it's metaphysically, I'm, I'm going to make a, a, a social prediction. I just bet it's not going to catch on. It's going to be considered to be too far out by most mainstream scientists, yeah. even if a big shot like Christoph uh, Koch yeah. um, is uh, is behind it. Well, um, yeah, it's either a sign of desperation or, or will be seen as a brilliant, yeah, hey, a listen, brilliant move. I mean, to me, it's not surprising that we would find out. You know, I mean, there's nothing special about this time and place in the history of the universe, and that you know, we humans here on Earth, our science gets to the point where we say, "Wow, it's not just mass energy." you know, working in an arena of space-time. We, we try to explain everything in terms of those those fundamentals, and then we can't. We say, oh, well, it's this emergent thing that happens when you get a certain amount of critical complexity. And, and uh, you know, that still seems more persuasive to me than the alternatives. But on the other hand, you know, there's times when we admit, you know, something new and basic. Now, you know, to back up, you know, with dark matter and dark energy, it's not like we were admitting something as basic as mass energy, space, time. But, yeah, you know, while, while admitting something like, you know, there's different words that people have come up to describe the fields or particles that would account for consciousness. And, and I mean, that's just incredibly radical. But to me, it makes it kind of exciting to think about george i just have to point something out <laughs> guess who believes in panpsychism oh uh, who deepak chopra oh well yeah <laughs> but uh, you know that yeah I, that, I won't quite let that ruin it for me but well and again that's something i should try to do in this column because there's kind of you know there are more than two probably but certainly Two main approaches, and one is panpsychism appears, to, you know, appeals to the whole kind of mystical Eastern. Everything is connected, and uh, you know, the universe is, you know, this great consciousness. You know, and that to me is all this very, you know, kind of, you know, nice, perhaps comforting, fluffy kind of stuff. And then there's the whole other argument from the philosophy of science, and you know, how do we know when we have the basic ingredients of the universe, and when do we do we justify um, become justified in considering, you know, some radical shift? And how do we know that the radical shift isn't um, just this arbitrary invention and, um, you know, no, no more valid than, than, uh, than the religious, the religious um, embracing of universal consciousness? So, I mean, th these are very difficult, probably impossible questions, but... Um, yeah, listen, there, uh, and, and meanwhile, we have something really interesting to write about. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is, I mean, that's the bottom. That, that's line. the main thing, you know. <laughs> Something, you know. I just love to have new things to think about and and write about and play play with in my column and books and. Me too. And um, I don't feel I don't feel like I have a real strong, you know. I don't have a horse in any of these races. I just kind of like to be the outside observer and and marvel over these things that are being done by these people that are a lot smarter than I am. Hey, listen, I, I want to, uh, I, I also want to make sure we talk about a column that you wrote recently, uh, yeah, or a couple, but the one I thought we'd talk about first um, oh. is on uh, artificial intelligence and the, uh, the, oh, the yeah. computer that won recently at Go. And, and the reason, I, you know, uh, this is, it's a, it's a natural segue is because artificial intelligence was also discussed at uh, Tucson and the singular. Oh yeah. They had a couple of Google people and yeah. you, you heard their plenaries, right? Yes. And they, they, they were like, like on, on computing and quantum computing. I, I, I didn't get to, uh, to the plenaries, but instead I came the day before. So that's how my schedule worked out. And I saw a couple of workshops that the same guys gave. And I think ah. they gave kind of similar talks on that. But, well, can you, well, but, can you just fill us in on, on the go 
the victory of a computer in the game of Go? Yeah. Well, I mean, basically what I was doing in the column was, um, you know, back when um, Deep Blue uh, beat Gary Gas Kasparov. Yeah. I, um, I, I wrote a, a fairly long cover piece for the Science Times section about, um, you know, how, you know, e even though uh, a computer, you know, has now, you know, beat a world chess champion, uh, this is not going to happen anytime soon with Go because it's immensely more complex. And I had this quote from uh, uh, Pete Hoot, um, theoretical physicist sure. at the Institute for Advanced Study, who's also a... Um, a uh, a go player and and thinks a lot about the game and and he had this great quote saying that it would be like a hundred years probably before a computer could uh, could be a human at the game of go just because uh, computers have not yet picked up this ability for subtle fluid uh, pattern matching and pat seeing patterns of patterns and you know it's kind of the you know the usual argument that a lot of people, especially I think like Doug Hostadter and uh, Melanie Mitchell and people that really emphasize the fluidity of intelligence and the elusiveness of metaphor and, and how this is not something that computers are going to probably get to just by brute force searching. Mm -hmm. And then kind of the question is, well, did uh, DeepMind, uh, the program that uh, beat, uh, beat the Korean uh, Go master, you know, did the, has, has this developed these amazing human-like abilities? And, and you know, in, in the take that I had on it, and, and I talked to Melanie Mitchell and Pete Hoot again, was that, uh, well, no, it doesn't. I mean, it's gone a lot further than Deep Blue did in supplementing brute force searching by, you know, unsupervised learning along with supervised learning and actually picking up on patterns and all of this. But um, it's still just not even close to what a, what a human brain does. And, you know, it seems very, very uncontroversial. And yet I got, you know, plenty of email from people who thought I was, you know, being kind of a Luddite for right. saying that. But You can't, you can't and, and again, there's this whole, it, it comes back to that same, I'm sorry, that, that same thing. I mean, you know, there, there's a point where you just kind of do the hand waving and say emergent properties and all of this mysterious stuff that the brain does, including consciousness and, uh, seeing patterns of patterns of patterns without, you know, being, you know, at least getting a, a head start with, um, with supervised learning, that this all comes out through some kind of emergent behavior. And, you know, maybe it does, and we'll never be able to explain the emergent behavior, and we'll make a computer that by all, or a computer system that by all appearances, you know, the Turing test or various extensions seems to be intelligent and cognizant and uh, conscious. And we'll never really know how that happened any more than we know how it happens with our brains. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 uh, well, I like that you stood up for humanity against the, uh, the evil machines. <laughs> but uh, I just, I, I, let me just tell you what one of the takeaways that I had from the, uh, the talk by talks by the Google. Guys. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But th those talks really stood out because they were, you know, it wasn't just hand wavy theory. It they were engineers. They're you know? doing stuff. Yeah, yeah, they're doing stuff. They're making things. Right, and uh, and both of them had um, were you know were, were telling us some fascinating stuff about advances that had been made in uh, one guy talked specifically about uh, quantum artificial intelligence, uh, AI built on yeah, quantum right. uh, computation devices. And there's something called quantum annealing, which- Oh, quantum annealing, yeah. Yeah, which- That's one of the earlier algorithms, I think, that they've been working on. But I guess they're actually getting some more impressive results. So. Yeah, and I, I know that Scott Aronson is this brilliant young computer yeah. scientist who I interviewed recently for my blog. Is a little, has given a hard time to some people at Google and elsewhere, I think, for hyping their uh, results a little bit too much. But it mm -hmm. it was impressive what this guy was doing. And, and then the other guy talked about Google's neural net programs, and these are associated with uh, what is now called deep learning. Neural nets have been around for, I don't know, 50 or yeah. 60 years, but apparently yeah. when they're- Well, there, there were some, yeah, there were some advances about, what, 10, 15 years ago. And I guess I they're, they're, the advances are accelerating now. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's leading yeah. to some really pretty crazy shit. And, 
And this guy talked about some programs, you know, some specific things that Google, I guess, I don't know if these would be called apps, but um, creative programs that can generate I mean, one of the things that uh, struck me was you can you can feed a program a, a photograph of like your kids and it'll make it yeah. look like a Picasso. Or yeah, a, right. They, yeah, they showed that. Yeah, at the workshop too. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. And he had all these other examples of creative programs. And then he talked about how they've also created a program that's like a critic uh, or yeah. an editor. And yeah. they combine it with the creative programs, and the, the critical yeah. program criticizes the creative program, <laughs> and, and then and they produce more interesting stuff as a result. Yeah, and it occurred to me, and I actually wrote this in uh, in my blog, that the critical program is kind of, I mean, it's a little scary, it's because it's kind of kind of what I do. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, could be replaced. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing, you know. I mean, all, you know, you, you, you know, if you. It, it, it's any of us could be simulated if you assume a certain <laughs> certain amount of um, computer power, right? And um, if it, just through you know brute force simulation and some you know and I you know it takes some pretty sophisticated programming, but you know anything you know if you take a human being as just being an input output device, you know of course you know you can in theory simulate something like that, so you can have a simulated science writer who's um, um, you know, writing about, you know, simulated scientists doing simulated science in their simulated labs. And, right. and but you know, these, these are kind of things that people have been marveling about with AI from the very, very early days. And, and I guess there's a sense that maybe with quantum computers doing AI, it brings you to a new level of um, computational power. Although, you know, that's not clear, I don't think. Yeah, it's still... It's still not quite up. So let me put in another point yeah. of this, this piece that I did uh, with Scott Aronson. He's, yeah, he's, he's really interesting. He's, he's like this kind of, I mean, he's, I think he's 34, but he's like a prodigy. He's freakishly yeah. smart. Well, he did a lot of the debunking of the D-Wave quantum computer system, which, yes, you know, the commercial thing that I guess Google's involved with that now. And, and I think, you know, just, that's enough. I just, if you don't mind a quick diversion, no, sure. that, that's kind of the same thing along with, you know, the thought of eventually making a artificial intelligence like the one in Thomas Powers' um, novel Galatea 2.0, oh, where you get this, oh, it's so good, and, and you get this this um, critical complexity of information processing, you know, everything that can be defined algorithmically, and yet suddenly, bing, <laughs> consciousness emerges. Right. And, um, and, and it's like, you know, but you can't, really explain how that happened any more than you can explain it with the brain. So what I said before, but now like with this D-Wave system, we have this computer that some people, its makers are complaining, is doing quantum computing. And and if I remember right, we have people like Scott Aronson saying, well, no, it's actually not doing quantum computing, or we don't know if it's doing quantum computing. And um, so it's, it's, it's it, it becomes like this incredibly complex object that we now have to develop theories about, even though it's something we invented. Yeah, I, so what I, what I was, was going to say is that uh, that's the per per perfect setup, is that if people want to know more about quantum computing, they should check out the blog of Scott Aronston. It's called Shtetl Optimized, and there's a story behind that. If they want to know the story, and if they also want an overview of Aronson's perspective, on uh, quantum computing um, and a lot of other things, mm -hmm. uh, then they should look at this uh, Q and A I did with him. I, you know, I do these Q and As, and I normally they, they normally run about one thousand to fifteen hundred mm -hmm. words. I sent. Oh, I, I thought, okay, Aronson, this is a smart guy. I'm going to really send him like the toughest questions, yeah. and the deepest mysteries in existence, and see what he comes up with. He sent me thirteen thousand words, and it's wow. all really fascinating really yeah. <laughs> stuff. a lot of great stuff on uh, uh, quantum uh, computers so I really urge people to uh, to uh, check that out ah I and, will I, I missed that one hey listen in the time we have left I oh, thought you're right we only have a few hour. minutes left yeah we both got to see 
what for me was maybe the highlight of the oh, uh, conference, I, which is I know Dorian, what you're say. Electra, and the Electrodes. Yeah, Dorian, Electra, and the Electrodes. <laughs> Wasn't that wonderful? Yeah. So what? Tell me what you thought. When did you see her? Okay, so on Wednesday, which I think was the the day. I think you you arrived on Wednesday, yes. and, and then were there Thursday. Right. And I um, I arrived on Monday and was there through Thursday morning, or left Thursday morning. So Wednesday night they have this thing called Club Consciousness. Mm -hmm. And well, actually, the, uh, at the very first plenary session um, of the conference, they showed this wonderful video called "Sensual" mm -hmm. with Dorian Electra and the Electrodes, and it's um, and I, I I describe this at the end of my column, but uh, it's um, it's based on the uh, debate between the empiricists and the rationalists, you know, John Locke and uh, Descartes. Right. And they have Dorian Electra and the Electrodes, and then Dorian Electra is taking the point of uh, the empiricists. You know, it's all feelings, feelings, feelings. And then, and then halfway in between, this uh, rapper, science rapper, who I didn't know about before, named Baba Brinkman, he comes in and gives this big put-down of empiricism and upholds Descartes and rationalism and <laughs> with this great rap, and it's just brilliantly produced. And then there's points where David Chalmers kind of pops in and, you know, does these little cameo appearances. So... <laughs> So first I saw that at the plenary, and then I saw on Wednesday that Dorian Electra and the Electrodes were going to be playing, and then they did other songs like Mind, Body, Problem, and Brain in a Vat, right. or The Chinese Room, you know, which is named after that thought experiment that the philosopher John Searle uses to, in his view, debunk the possibility of AI. Right. And they were showing these videos with these funny little pictures of John Searle and, and wheeling around brains in a vat. And, and so I knew this had to be the end of my column. And then it was funny then to, to see part four of your, uh, of your accounts of the conference and seeing that you ended the same way, except she she had she did another performance on Friday, yes. right? Called "End of Consciousness well, uh, Party." It was Saturday night, yeah. Saturday, Saturday night. yeah, right. Yeah, it was called the End of Consciousness Party, <laughs> and it was it was funny because I, you know, as I say in this uh, this dispatch um, on that uh, day, I was getting kind of bummed out by all the. You know, the sort of foolishness and all the interest in ESP and, and this fringe stuff yeah. by this time. I was just kind of getting beaten down by the irrationality of uh, of uh, humans. And um, and I kind of, you know, I wasn't, I was thinking of skipping the, the party, but I decided, ah, oh, what the hell. Oh, big mistake. Gonna yeah. go. And that was, <laughs> it was great. Oh, my God. She, oh. She's, because she is a great performer. Really. Yeah dynamic and and sexy i mean i just thought i was i was blown away by her and then she's singing all these songs about the most abstract topics yeah. in, in modern yeah. philosophy yeah it was it was it was really funny but it was also fantastic rock and roll oh yeah and during the during the meetings you know they, they did this video each day uh at the end of each meeting and in part of it they have dorian electra interviewing you know some of the participants Oh, really? You know, asking some you know pretty sophisticated philosophical questions, and then they had Baba Brinkman at the end of each day doing a rap follow up yeah. on. Um, and he actually pointed out to me later in an email that uh, even though you know you know I said in my piece that you know it really bothered me that you know people weren't challenging the fact that uh, Deepak Chopra had such a prominent starring role in the conference that indeed Baba Brinkman did have this, some put downs of of Chopra in his rap. But of course, he also had put downs of Hammer Off and everybody, kind of in typical, you know, in your face rap kind of, kind of style. And then I also heard heard back from uh, Dorian Electra, who um, points out that there's a new, uh, there's a link to one of her videos now for I think uh, Mind Body Problem. It's now on the web, so oh, so excellent. we can li link to that. And yeah, so, yeah, it's so fun being a science writer. <laughs> right. Listen, yeah. I just have to point out that Baba Brinkman. I didn't see him, but he also was at the Skeptics Conference that, oh. that I went to. So there must be, you know, there's this, there must be this troop of performers who go to these sciencey conferences. I and, guess so. And yeah. uh, can make a living doing that. It certainly livens things up. And he, he has a uh, an off Broadway show now about rapping about climate change. Oh, that's great. 
Yeah, he's been around a while. And actually, when you look up Dorian Electra, she was earlier involved. Uh, she got a, a fair amount of news coverage when she she did a uh, a rock video praising the economist. Uh, what's his name? Hayek. Oh shit! You know the great uh, you know lover of libertarianism and loved by libertarians. Yeah. And, and this resulted in some interesting blowback. And <laughs> and uh, the world is just such a endlessly complex place. Yeah, it's, it's like, who cares if they solve the mind body problem, as long as we can kind of yeah. go along for the ride with all these crazy people. Yeah, 100 years from now, we'll still be having the conferences, probably. I hope so. I hope the entertainment's as good. Yeah. Okay, man. John, it was a pleasure. Yeah, that was that was really great, and uh, <laughs> I hope it's been a long time since we talked. So um, I, yeah, let's we should try to get back to doing this monthly. I'd really like that. More or less, sounds good to me too. All right, talk soon. Okay. <laughs>